I would like to call the uh, special meeting to order the joint meeting of the Fargo and West Fargo school boards. It is Tuesday, January 22nd at 4 p.m. And right now, I would like to call to the um, podium Dr. David Flowers. He will be giving us a presentation on the LRE Behavior Task Force recommendations. And following his presentation, we will have opportunity for discussions and questions. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, do this in so-called retirement. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we um, are presenting tonight a quick overview, actually, of six weeks, uh, six meetings uh, over the course of, of time between September and December. Um, you may recall that this group was commissioned, actually, after the two districts had planned to do a collaborative effort and then there were some concerns and opposition to that and the boards decided uh, to convene a study committee to look uh, into the issue of how to best meet the needs of children with severe behavior needs uh, in the, the two districts and or the region. So uh, I have completed a complete report which is over 30 pages as well as an executive summary and I'll further condense that this evening into a PowerPoint. But I think that the audience and the boards um, also have the executive summary as well as the complete report. So just know that I am trying to synthesize uh, the work of you know, 12 hours um, and some of that work away from the, the meetings also in the form of study and, and readings. So this was the charge and the charge was, was given to me um, after a planning committee made up of administrators, I think, charged by the boards to, uh, to come up with a framework or an outline for the study uh, that this, this uh, committee would undertake. So this is the charge uh, to make advisory recommendations, and I emphasize that we made this point to the committee a number of times, that they were an advisory committee, uh, and that they were to give advice regarding programming services, configuration, locations, cost to serve and support children with strong behavioral needs. And then further you see the, um, the charge broken down into some subparts. Look at how our children are currently being served. Uh, look at different types of services and supports and curriculum needs to support students with behavior needs. Reach consensus on critical attributes of desired programming and services. In other words, if we're going to add uh, any kind of a, a, a program or service on the continuum of services, then what should be its ingredients or specifications? And then reach consensus on the most, con con uh, the most feasible configurations uh, for our community and region. In other words, by configuration we mean uh, locations and arrangements for delivering the services and then rep uh, provide a report of the task force's work. So that was the charge initially. Uh, the <coughs> committee met on the, the dates that you see outlined. There were over 50 members. Not all of them were voting members, but they represented a range of, of stakeholders, including school board members, legislators, parents, administrators, teachers, community members, and advocates and service providers. Those that were not voting members, uh, some were actually um, you know, in the room as, um, as resources and you know, shared in the discussions and provided information. Uh, we met on the six dates. Originally, the, the work was outlined to occur in five meetings, but the process evolved and uh, task force members requested other steps and processes that extended the, the need to go another meeting to uh, complete the group's work. This was the original outline of work uh, that the task force was done. That This is where I came in and started to try to chunk out the work of the group. How will we meet the charge? What processes, what activities um, will be most appropriate in order to you know, meet the, the charge of the group? 
So uh, that included introductions and understanding the purpose and identifying the problem that the task force was addressing and establishing norms and agreeing to a process to use in order to study uh, the issues. Um, <clears throat> in terms of solutions and brainstorming, we, we did work first on critical attributes and uh, reached consensus on that, and then we were to evaluate and rank those critical attributes, and we'll go into a little bit of detail there so that you know what the critical attributes are and how they were valued, relatively speaking, by the task force. And then uh, we moved to looking at uh, the configurations and looking at the pros and cons. Again, the steering committee gave an, an initial list of potential configurations that was added to by the task force. They were given the opportunity to think of okay, anything else that the steering committee hasn't thought of that might be a viable configuration that should be studied. And the group uh, was to determine the pros and cons, the advantages and disadvantages. And uh, as you'll see, actually also to look at the potential alignment between a potential configuration and the critical attributes that the group drafted. And then um, to make advisory recommendations uh, regarding the attributes and the potential top two or three models. Again, advisory recommendations. So starting on that far left box, uh, at the first meeting, uh, the group looked at norms, and they, I'll not read these, they, they decided that uh, these would be the norms. These were suggested up front by the steering committee, and the group had the opportunity to add to or adjust the norms as they saw fit. We did decide, I'll, I'll focus just for a minute, on uh, the norm of consensus being 80% or greater and I outlined for them that to determine the degree of consensus, we would use uh, potentially a couple of different processes. One, the low-tech FIST-to-five um, model. If you're not familiar with that, that means that you know, if there's something being proposed to the group, then the facilitator would ask them to show their degree of support for that concept. And if they were enthusiastically and overjoyed with the idea, then they'd show a, you know, a hand of five fingers and if at the other end of the continuum, if it was over my dead body, I, would, I won't stand for that, then they would show a fist. And anyone that showed a fist, a one or a two, would have the opportunity to try to convince the rest of the group. Okay, mu much of the time we were able to use um, response software, clickers, so that we could register immediately and know, um, you know uh, the consensus or the degree thereof in the group. This is an important point, you know, because part of the charge was to try to reach consensus, and um, that's difficult with 50 people in, in the room. So we had to have a plan up front uh, under the norms for how we would, we would do this. So <clears throat> that, uh, that was the first part of the process. The first meeting was organizational and establishing those norms and uh, reaching some consensus on the process, and they were supportive of what we outlined as a process at that uh, first meeting. So um, they also needed to understand the current services. A couple of things that happened uh, to do that. Um, John Porter, who's the director of the regional uh, special ed co-op, gave an overview of what services are being delivered now in special education, uh, what, what does the continuum look like currently. Uh, this is from the State Department uh, DPI handbook and website so that we know what we're talking about here and how children with with any kinds of needs along the continuum but this group was focused on the least restrictive environment for behavior needs so you see that a level a is where students are inside the regular classroom 80 percent of the day um, and a level b they're inside the regular class no more than 79 percent and less than 40 percent of the day and level C is inside the regular class for less than 40% of the day. And then level D, uh, which does not exist for elementary children in either the two school districts, nor to my knowledge in the state. Uh, and I would tell you also that in addition to the members of the task force that were in the room, DPI was participating as well um, by Skype. 
they were they were listening in and, and following along as well. Uh, so that they also are interested in the work that uh, the task force uh, was doing and in the work that the boards have commissioned. So those are definitional, just so everyone understood uh, what the continuum of services is. Uh, it became a point that had to be clarified at one point during the work of the task force because when we said that there was no level D, uh, the point was raised that there is a program currently at Agassiz right now for middle level uh, where the students are more restricted than in a traditional level C. But we made it clear that uh, uh, the earlier statements were regarding elementary programs. And of course, um, each district either independently or collectively would need to decide whether it will ever be necessary to, to add a level of services and what uh, grade range of students might be served in that program. So the next step uh, that the group tackled was to talk about critical attributes. In other words, if we are going to um, consider adding a program in the continuum of services then what are the specifications? What, what does this group that's taken a deeper dive into this issue than any other lay, lay group uh, in our community, what do they think are the most critical attributes? What elements should be heavily considered uh, to make sure that they are a part of such a program? So we gave them a prompt. We said, answer this or complete this prompt, a program serving children who have exhibited very intense behaviors must, and then I suggested a format that those attributes should begin with a verb, such as provide or include or be characterized by and ensure that and so forth, and that they should state the attribute in positive terms, what will the program do, not will it, what will it not do. Um, so that was the prompt, and through a couple of meetings, they um, used a number of processes, including an affinity diagram process where everybody individually was able to write things on sticky notes. Then at tables, and there were eight tables most evenings for this group. Then at their tables, they shared their individual input and then collectively arranged those into categories. You know, what affinity existed among those categories and groups? And then what kind of a label might they give those categories? And then we began to um, distill that among the whole group. Um, and on this next slide, uh, you begin to see the categories that they came up with. And they also then finally reached consensus, as you'll see, on the actual definition of each of these broad categories. So there were 10 uh, curriculum goals and transitions, environment and culture, social emotional learning and each of these has a definition as you saw in the report parent and uh, family engagement community partners safety and appropriate space budget sustainability staff training professional development best practices and relationships so you see an example here of the definition for one of the those attributes uh, and that is social emotional learning. The program must provide a mental health based curriculum that supports social and emotional learning and trauma informed and culturally responsive practices. Each of these went through some wordsmithing by the whole group. I distilled the input uh, for the initial um, wording and then they had the opportunity at a subsequent meeting to further wordsmith it and, and clarify and, and share perspectives and advocate for certain words being included or not. So uh, I feel pretty confident that these attributes now represent uh, a consensus of the group and you'll see that they had the opportunity to, to show to what degree they had consensus. So for each of those attributes then, for example, this is the first one and I am going to read this to you. Um, academic goals and transitions. So if it's just the heading, you know, what does that mean? Well, they said that means that the program must identify and address the individual academic, social, and emotional needs of each child and monitor progress on the needs that made a more restrictive placement appropriate with clear and frequent monitored 
goals and criteria for returning to a less restrictive environment. That was a theme, that was a, that was a concern, uh, if not a fear, that we would create a life sentence for children if we created a more restrictive environment. That they'd, have, they'd be sentenced to this more restrictive environment and there wouldn't be clear parameters for how they got there and how they might get back into a less restrictive environment. So that's an example of the give and take that happened to arrive at the wording that you see in front of you in the final report. Um, and then they had the opportunity to express to what degree they valued this attribute being passed on this evening. Uh, so here's an example for that first one. So by the definition of the group, I would say that was strong consensus uh, to, they were asked the question, here's the statement that we came up with. This is an important critical attribute. Strongly agree to strongly disagree. And you can see that 90% uh, because of rounding that adds up to 101, but uh, the rounding that the software does. <clears throat> so a couple more examples. Environment, culture, and climate. Uh, the program must create and sustain a safe, calm, and welcoming environment based on a culture of trust, respect, and empathy informed by knowledge of each child's background and individual needs. Again, very strong consensus. So each of these, here's the social and emotional learning. You already saw the definition of that. There's the level of consensus on that one being an important attribute. So they were engaged in a couple of processes then so that you as board members and the staff that might need to process the input of this group could better understand collectively where they were about the relative value and importance. All of them were deemed imp important, but we, we, we forced them <laughs> to, to tell us, all right, which ones are really the most important if you had to decide? So they were asked, first of all, to rank them. Um, one to 10, what's the first, the most important and what's the least important? And you know, you can come up with a ranking based on the numbers that you see here but we asked them to, uh, to take another step as well so that we'd have multiple measures of, of their values. And that was called a forced choice process. If you've not ever done that, it's kind of mind-wrenching <laughs> uh, because you're forced to compare one against the other. So if you had to decide between the, the one uh, the critical goals and transitions, uh, curriculum goals and transitions, versus environmental and cultural and climate concerns, which would you choose? So every member um, completed that. And the results show this ranking, that when they did the forced choice, they saw staff training, you know, the preparation, you know, having a high quality staff, well prepared and well supported was the most important thing. Having appropriate space and safety features was the second most in the forced choice ranking. The social emotional learning ranked third. Uh, curriculum goals transitions and having those clear entry exit criteria was fourth and, and so forth. So we uh, synthesized that or the facilitator did. So you see here, uh, you, you already know from the Likert scale that they, they valued all of them. Uh, but when they were forced to rank them and to do the forced choice, then we were able to come up with a little bit clearer idea of the relative value that the group placed on these, these critical attributes. So <clears throat> you can see that the academic goals and transitions ranked first and fourth. Um, for most of these, you see them shaded green because they're, uh, the, the ones that are shaded in green in both columns were in the top five in both um, and pretty close on the others. So. We ultimately came up with, with this. Uh, that has the statement to the right, of course, that each attribute generated was deemed important. But if you really want to know what are the top five and the, the five that are a little less valued, um, if they're forced to choose, then the, this chart shows that. So uh, the top five are that academic goals and transitions, the environment, culture, and climate, the social emotional learning, safety and appropriate space, and the staff training and professional development. And then on the next slide, you see 
uh, the next five again. All important, but relatively speaking. Um, I, I made a point, in a, a place or two in the written report about number seven, budget and sustainability. <laughs> I suspect that if the school board did the fourth choice ranking, uh, that budget and sustainability would, would rank higher. Ultimately, um, the board or the boards will have to weigh that one very, very carefully. What, what will this cost? And if, if it is decided ever to add a more restrictive environment, what would it cost? And is it sustainable? So uh, next, we asked them, all right, you've told us that these attributes are critically important to be included in any um, additional program. The point was raised uh, if, in a number of instances that these attributes really should be weighed and considered for all of our programming. That we should be evaluating, how are we doing now? So we gave them the opportunity to tell us, how do you think we're doing on each of these? So we gave them this rubric. Um, and ask them to weigh in on each of the attributes. So the continuum is, this is an attribute of significant strength in the way we're currently offering our program, programs on our current continuum of services. This is an attribute where some improvement is needed or significant attention to improving this attribute is needed or at the bottom of the scale, this attribute is simply absent to any perceptible or desirable degree. So they evaluated all 10 of those attributes. And each of them, uh, remember this is a collective group coming from different perspectives, uh, different stakeholder groups, even different districts. So what frame of reference they had in their mind, were they thinking of the Fargo district or the West Fargo district or one of the rural districts? Or were they trying to think collectively? Uh, we don't know for sure, but uh, it still was a, an important exercise, and uh, here uh, in the report you see uh, how they weighed in, and I would tell you just a, in summary that uh, all of the attributes were ones that they thought needed some attention. So for that first one, you can see that over half thought that that was an area that needed significant attention, and I suspect that it was the area of, in the definition, that knowing how a child gets into the program and how they might get into a less restrictive environment is the area that, that many were thinking needs, needs strengthening. I'm sharing with you, um, you know, the, those most important ones, the top five, I'm sharing how they, they thought you were, were doing on those. So environment, culture, and climate in uh, a little better. 47% thought it needed significant improvement and 10% uh, thought that this was an attribute with significant strength and that we should sustain the good work that we're doing and 40% uh, thought uh, there, it just needed some improvement. The social emotional learning uh, showed this pattern. Again, um, well over 50% only a little less, only 39% thought that it just needed a little bit of improvement or was a strength. So to summarize the work on the attributes, um, again, to review all of the attributes should be considered important and of value. But based on the perception of the task force, only three of these attributes were seen as strengths, and those were attribute two, environment, culture, and climate, attribute nine, best practices, and attribute 10, relationships. All of the uh, attributes have needed improvement, and uh, some of them need, uh, over 60% said that uh, it needed significant improvement or was not in place to any significant degree. And those were social and emotional learning, parent and family engagement, community partnerships, safety and appropriate space, and staff training and professional development. And I'm sure that that mixed in with, with uh, the, those perceptions were concerns about child and, and staff safety and, and all of those elements that, uh, that we know have been concerns that 
that generated some of the need for the task force to do its work at all. So uh, the group continued to reference the attributes and the importance of the attributes and began to express the idea that these attributes, um, whether the districts ever consider a more restrictive environment or not, the um, drafting of these attributes and the clarification and definition of these attributes and the evaluation of the degree to which we're doing well on these should inform our planning, uh, our professional development, um, our programming, because there's room for improvement. So the next phase then, after we had done the attributes, was to actually begin to analyze the, um, <clears throat> the potential configurations. The list A through G were ones that were uh, conceived by, the, uh, by the, the steering committee. You know, as they brainstormed and, and handed off to the committee, look, here's what we've thought of as p potential configurations, both within an individual district and uh, those that might be collaboratives that would engage more than one district. And then at the request of task force members, they added uh, configuration H, which was don't make any additional programs um, at a level D or above, work on improving levels A through C and do nothing in terms of additional programming. So they wanted to evaluate and talk about that one as well. So the, the format was uh, what you see on the right there. Um, <clears throat> we were to look at each of these, talk about the pros and cons, and, and then ultimately determine to what degree do these various configurations have the potential to deliver on the critical attributes that uh, the task force came up with. So that kind of a paradigm would look like this. You know, uh, would the configuration have no or a very minimal chance of, of uh, having congruence with the attributes? zero to two of the attributes and so forth. So conceptually, uh, it might look like these next two diagrams with Venn, di Venn diagrams, that there's very little overlap there um, between the, the proposed configuration or delivery model and, and the ability to address the con con uh, critical attributes. And this one, there's a little bit more overlap. So they were able to uh, talk about the pros and cons one by one, uh, at their tables, they talked about pros and cons of each configuration. Then they shared with the whole group uh, the, the process that we use with, for a given configuration, one table would be on point. They would be the recorder for that particular configuration, uh, recording their own, and then listening as we shared out in the large group for any additional pros and cons or advantages, disadvantages uh, of that configuration. So you find in the final report an analysis of the pros and cons for every one of those configurations, A through H. But we then, after they were able to talk about them, to sh share the pros and cons, discuss them in detail, then we did go to the response software and we asked them, all right, using this kind of model, what's the degree of uh, potential uh, congruence for that particular configuration. And you see the summary right here. And, <clears throat> and you don't see any 80 percents. Okay. In other words, there was no configuration that just leapt off the page that, that people said, this is it. If you ever consider doing a more restrictive environment, then here's the one that 80 percent of this group representing diverse stakeholders in the community, here's the one. So the best that we have is that deep analysis that they did and um, the relative ranking of each configuration. So you can see that, and I'll show you a, a graphic representation of each of these here in, in a minute, but the top three were uh, F, a special program at a regional center detached from a district building. In other words, it's a separate building. Two, a special program within the district attached to a district building. And G, a special program contracted with an outside 
agency. So just for clarification, um, C would be a, uh, a program within a district. So each district would be kind of on their own. That's not one that would be collaborative. F would be. So you can see a graphic representation in the report, but I've only summarized in this PowerPoint the three top ones. So we tried to represent graphically what this con uh, looks like conceptually. So this is F, a special program at a regional center detached from a district building. So you see it's represented as a separate oval within District A, and there's no intention here by the, the proximity, the location, or the size of these shapes to depict which district or districts these might be. But conceptually, District A would be uh, the host of this program, and this is a regional center. It's not connected to a building. It's a separate facility, and children from within District A as well as from other districts in the region that might be participants in this partnership could, um, could send children with needs that could be served by this center uh, to the, 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 the program. So <clears throat> um, this uh, is the rubric again. We asked them to, to evaluate it. And you can see that there was, there was some real pretty strong even uh, on the bottom that, uh, no, I don't think the configuration match is very good. But th this is the best <laughs> uh, that you get. You get 23% that said there's very significant um, <laughs> potential eight or more of the attributes. And, and then 60% uh, significant congruence and then moderate congruence at 10%. So you add those up. And there were uh, some of these that tied back in the chart. I'll go back to that for just a second. So if they, um, if they tied, then we went to that, that middle category the, uh, and added that one in. What, whichever one had the greater um, in that um, middle category then uh, won the tie. So uh, then for, the, for this particular configuration, the special program at a regional center detached from a district building as for every one of these configurations, you see the group's work providing you with advantages and disadvantages. And again, you don't see any of these where, oh, it, it's obvious. It's just way outweighs the, you know, the, the uh, pros way outweigh the, the cons. It didn't happen. There are advantages and disadvantages to each of these configurations. So this is, it's a tough topic. It's a tough uh, issue. Um, but again, uh, and I'll not go into the, the detail of reading these to you because they're all in the final report, um, but, but you do see that the group provides you with uh, lots of data about each of these. The second highest ranked one was a special program within the district attached to a district building. And the task force was uh, very understanding and clear of this, and, and the boards need to be as well. Here we're talking about each district being on their own. So this is not uh, a program that District A, B, and C could send their children to in District A, like the, the previous one. This one would be each district deciding, do we have a need for such a, a more restrictive program in our district? And if so, the task force that studied this said that in such a circumstance, the best thing would be for it to be attached to an existing building. Uh, it could be built onto it. It could be an a wing of an existing building. But they, they valued um, it at least being attached. Uh, and as you would see, if you dive into the advantages and disadvantages, you see some, some reasons and rationale for that. So this is what the, the vote on that would look like. Um, you see that it was 40% uh, in the significant category. And then when you add the 30%, it was pretty high, actually, um, if you look at the, the middle category through the, the top category. And again, this one, um, 
<laughs> when you look at the list, it looks like there are more disadvantages than adva advantages. But, um, and you see that the, the group members had in mind the idea that if this is a, a program attached to an existing building, that it still needs to be planned carefully. It needs to be available space, either that's available or that could be built on um, so that you could do things like have specific space for community partners, that there would be room for that to happen. Uh, you, you could remodel and or build it from scratch to make sure that uh, it was specially designed for safety. Remember uh, one of the, the first things also that the task force did was they did hear uh, descriptions of programs to uh, they're called level four facilities in Minnesota, Carner Blue and the, the Lakes Country uh, program. And both of those programs emphasized under that idea of safety and appropriate space that these be thoughtfully planned with the idea of uh, the, the space and the, where doors are and the way the facility is designed can contribute to the success and and uh, the safety of children and staff. And then the third highest ranked uh, was a special program contracted with an outside agency. So again, this one would be a regional center. The school district or districts would not run it. Uh, the outside agency would run it and it would have, you know, a specific uh, you know, mental health services focus and uh, the school districts would of course <coughs> contribute to and participate in the design of the curricular piece but this one would be uh, one actually operated by probably a mental health provider entity. And this one uh, had some strong on the, on the bottom end of the scale but then relatively strong on the other end as well. And again, the group provided um, pros and cons of this particular configuration. And <clears throat> uh, you can see that they were, they were looking at things like um, it being highly specialized and individualized, you know, having a strong focus on, on uh, mental health needs and strong collaborations among educators and behavioral and mental health uh, services. So <clears throat> that's an overview of the work that the group did. I'm going to give you some final observations and recommendations that were synthesized from all of that work. Uh, first of all, on the critical attributes, I think that uh, it should be considered to share these widely among staff and use them as guidelines for evaluating current programming within each district, as I said earlier, that was collective. The, there were participants from many stakeholder perspectives and different districts. Uh, so maybe a deeper dive within each district. How are we doing on this? Let's, let's talk about these attributes and where can we improve and, and what do they mean? Um, <clears throat> use them also as a framework for professional development and program improvement and use them as specifications, certainly, if there is consideration of adding additional programming, uh, like a more restrictive program, a uh, level D. Second observation or recommendation uh, relates to the configurations and delivery models and locations. Um, and the advice there is if, if the districts do see the need uh, for a level D pro program, then consider the task force's analysis of the pros and cons of each of these uh, configurations. Um, note that of the top two, one is regional and the other is isolated within a district. So collectively and individually, the districts still have work to do in deciding uh, to what degree is such programming needed and uh, is there energy and commitment to collaborate accomplish that or would we do it on our own uh, as individual districts. The third highest rank configuration um, that contracting with an outside agency would require a very strong partner and there were suggestions in the group 
and the presence of members of the group that um, would be, I think, willing partners in that discussion uh, should districts decide to explore that further. And then the fourth configuration, remember, was that one that was added by the task force at their request, which was don't add any additional program. Take these attributes and improve what you're doing now. Use them as the previous recommendations suggested for professional development and program evaluation and so forth. And <clears throat> I think that there was, there was a consensus that, yeah, that needs to happen regardless. And so uh, the last point there that I underlined under configurations, none of these configurations reached 80% consensus. Nothing leaped out. Um, it's a clear indication that among this diverse group of stakeholders that wrestled with this for 12 hours plus, uh, that the addition of a level D environment remains a somewhat controversial topic. There's still issues and concerns uh, about that. Costs, remember the budget and sustainability was not in the top five attributes. Um, nevertheless, as I, as I observed earlier, it's going to be a top concern um, with the group at the table now. And then finally, just move carefully in implementation of a more restrictive environment um, level D. Um, be careful about the, the needs that um, are expressing themselves and how best to meet those. But you do have a lot of data and input from this group um, that uh, would be helpful in that consideration. The last thing we did is we gave them an opportunity to evaluate the process. Um, and they were asked to respond to this rubric, the process used by the task force to provide advisory input was appropriate given the size of the group and the complexity of the tasks. Uh, there was 80% uh, consensus on that, as you can see, the neutral and above. If you were doing fist to five, it would be all threes, fours, and, and fives. And then um, we asked them to respond to this. I can support their report and the advisory recommendations that will be shared with the boards and again uh, less strong because they hadn't seen the report yet um, but it was uh, again over 80 percent so I think that we do owe this group a debt of gratitude they worked hard it was tough work um, and I, I think that they they did a good job with this with this task and I'm going to conclude the formal report and I think I'll join you at the table and I believe the next thing on your agenda is to have some discussion. Um, <clears throat> I would certainly be prepared to answer any questions about the process or the report itself. Uh, if the discussion leads to what are the next steps and those kinds of things then you have the two superintendents at the table and you have resources behind me as well and, and at the table that could help in that discussion. So I'll stop. All right, thank you, Dr. Flowers, for that uh, presentation. And we'll have you join us here at the table for any, <coughs> any questions that we have. Uh, the agenda does have us adjourning at 5. That gives us about 15 minutes to ask some questions. We might be able to go just a little bit longer than that. But I know Fargo Board of Education has a meeting starting at 5.30. And we have a few blocks to walk over or drive over to that location. I do want to thank all of the community members that were involved and the staff. Uh, definitely, as Dr. Flowers, you mentioned, no other group on the community has studied or thought as deeply about these issues than the task force. No other collective group. That doesn't mean as individuals we haven't and as individual school districts we haven't, but collectively um, it was wonderful to be able to have this community conversation. So I would like to turn it over to you, Dr. Flowers, if you would like to facilitate um, anyone that has questions. Uh, please feel free to go ahead and do so and let's just have a, a sharing of time so that as many people that have questions have the opportunity to ask them. Thank you. Yeah, this is for Rupak and Beth. Uh, right now, how many students in your district, in our districts, do you think would qualify for a level D? I've, tour, I've toured all of our elementary schools in West Fargo and I've, I have seen a need for the, some sort of a facility or, or some sort of a program. Because I've, I've seen one school where the principal actually gave up their office because of a, a student that's been disruptive. So I'm just curious to see how many, if we would, we're, we're going to collaborate together. 
Sure, I'll start. And and I don't want to not be able to give a number, but the truth is that given the process and for how students would qualify going through the IEP process, um, it's hard to say. I Even if I were to share numbers of level C students, how many students we are currently in our level C program, that would be an unfair way to determine how many potential students that could be in level D because we have students that are in that program and that need to be in that program. One thing that I would want to point out is that if there was a level D facility, not only would we potentially look at students that might not be served um, properly in a level C program, but there's also students that currently we have to sh recommend to a level E facility, which is a residential facility, um, that potentially could benefit from a level D facility, but they're going into a more restrictive environment because we just don't have that option in our community right now. So it's hard to just give a number because that would be an IEP team decision. And I would add that I would say the same thing, but I know the number is relatively small. Um, it's not a large population, but we have students who are moving here from Minnesota and from across the country where a level four is what they call it. That is written in their IEP and we don't have a level four program. So um, when we came into this process, I would agree with uh, Superintendent Gandhi in that the, the conversation came because we have students who are having struggles in a C and are now candidates for residential and that is out of our city and our region at the elementary level. So without that, le that level of service, that was our focus to what can we do to help keep um, those students in our district and in our schools. So the conversation moving forward would be really looking at these attributes. And again, um, I think there is a great value in analyzing our A, B, and C using this. And we've talked, um, Superintendent Gandhi and I talked about that as being our very next step. Um, but then um, from there, you know, really analyzing what those numbers are. And the parents are key, as well as the IEP team in making those decisions. This task force was not set up to make decisions for other people's children. It was set up to look at attributes that we would want to ensure in all of our districts that these levels are being addressed. So each child is an individual with an individualized plan and the parent and that team make the decisions for that individual child. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Brandy. Well, I do have a question because I, I hear the Carner Blue um, is in the report and that that was looked at. But I guess my big um, curiosity is what other level D besides that Carner Blue, other than the one in Minnesota, is there other states that have this level D that has been looked at than just this Carner Blue? I guess that's my question. I would have referred to um, maybe our special education director. There are other programs um, across, I think, the state of Minnesota specifically and in other states. Um, we were very uh, impressed with the level of services that Carner Blue, but that was just a starting point to kind of think outside the box of what we have done here in West Fargo and Fargo, looking at what some other models are. But I would refer to our, both our special ed directors on other programming that they've seen. I, I believe I'm a special ed director sitting at the table right now. So, oh, thank you. Here. So, um, collectively as a group, and what was brought to here, I would not say that we heard from a plethora. We heard from uh, the uh, Fergus Falls area, and we heard from Carner Blue. I can tell you from receiving students from other states who do have, we'll call it level four, level D. Uh, those programs do exist in many other states as well. Um, I've had the opportunity to talk to one principal, just did a little bit about what theirs looked like, and we were talking from the state of New York. Um, looks a little bit different in the big cities. So, That was my question, because it, everything keeps on going back to Carner Blue. And I mean, if that's the only one we're looking, no. you know what I mean? That's, right. that, that was my question. I mean, if that's, you know, and then the second one is then, who went down to do the investigate? I mean, was it psychology um, folks that went with? I mean, was it autistic professionals that went with? I mean, that's, that's my big, mm -hmm. you know, that's another mm -hmm. part of the question. There's been a team of professionals who've gone to visit and to observe, um, but we also would include at the next level our school psychologists, our BCBA, um, all of those who have, can ask the right questions to make sure we develop the best programming 
to go forward. And we have looked at programs in other states as well, um, including like Georgia. Um, it, it, most of them are um, uh, separate from the general population. They're more of a, like Connor Blue, mm -hmm. yeah. But they, um, they're very similar in how they set their program up. They're magnet schools. They're not embedded within a school. If I can chime in one thing as well, I know uh, Director Cummings referenced the Fergus Falls Center. Uh, that was from Lakes Country, Minnesota. And I think one thing that makes districts uh, such as West Fargo and Fargo unique in our metropolitan area is our district size. So when we're looking at comparable services in other states, uh, we're not necessarily looking at what other districts are doing. We're looking at what other regions are doing. So the Lakes County services that we looked at and presented to our task force as well, they serve a variety of districts because they serve a large group of smaller school districts, not districts that are north of 10,000 students each. So I think that's why we sometimes look at Carner Blue because Carner Blue serves a larger group of students at one facility coming from one geographic region. Okay, and then I do have one more mm -hmm. question. Um, what does the workforce look like as far as, you know, psychology, mental health um, providers? I mean, that, that's going to be a, a huge deal with, with everything that you guys have done, and thank you very much for doing that. But I just want to know what the, you know, workforce does look like to be able to hire more of these professional people to help our kids. <laughs> That's where we really look to our outside agencies and join partnerships and find out you know, what they have, what's available. They have their own um, strenuous training programs that they have, bring people into their systems and train them. And when they, like for example, we're partners with Solutions um, and Carlson um, and uh, North Dakota Autism Center. And every time we have staffing needs, they go out and look for the uh, people to hire if they're short staffed and they start training them and have their own regular sta rigorous standards to meet the needs of our students. So it is a challenge because we are short of staff across the, the district and the state. It's hard to find the right people for the job. So far we've been able to maintain, but it's a challenge I see us going forward. Mm -hmm. uh, school psych psychology is one that is considered across the state of North Dakota in a critical shortage. We are starting to see the effects of special education teachers being in a critical shortage as well. Um, that's one of the things that we talked about in terms of even looking at if you specialized within your own district, how you could pool the resources that you have into a particular program um, rather than seeing it spread across the district. So you have had help then from Ann Carlson and the, uh, you said the Autistic you, Autism Center? The, North the Autism, Autism Center. Center. Okay. Yes, we have. We contract with them all the time for different students with different needs. To, to add to that, West Fargo partners with many of the, the agencies. I mean, those agencies were at the table, and I would say one of the best parts of this task force, even though we didn't come to 80% agreement, was the conversations that happened and really opening up the conversation about how we can really meet the needs of these students because our schools are a reflection of the community, and we have many, many needs beyond even... Um, some of the conversations we were having, but it brought people together and created connections that we've already started having meetings with some of these groups. What can you do? What can you do? Well, what are the barriers? Why, why are we struggling with the funding? Why are we struggling with the billing? Um, and having those conversations with our legislators and with these agencies, I think, was one of the best parts of the, the conversation and very good use of our time. Um, we don't have 80% agreement on what to do, but we do know that now that we're collaborating, people don't know that West Fargo and Fargo are already collaborating. We came from a meeting before this meeting talking about our career and technical education. We have students that go from West Fargo over to Fargo South. They send students over to Cheyenne. When we pool our resources and in our shortage areas with finding educators, we can serve students better. That's what the conversation is about. And could I add with the collaborating with the community and with Ann Carlson and other great facilities, um, the Autism Center. The collaboration is awesome and we are really grateful for that. We still have to remember that they're not schools. They're not, they're not a school within a district and they don't have the educational component. So even partnering, there is still a strain uh, on our district, on our districts to be able to figure out 
the successful educational programming as well. And what do you mean by, I don't understand that. You, you mean the people from Ann Carlson and the Autism Center, they don't have the school background? Is that what you, what do you they're mean? They're not educators. They're not teachers. They're not highly qualified teachers. Right. Okay, so but if you're dealing with somebody with um, issues that needs a psychologist, why? I don't understand. We that. utilize their services, and again, so grateful, and we have built some really great relationships that way and collaborative efforts. School districts are still responsible for educating this, the, the student. I do want to make, sorry, I do want to make sure we have about five more minutes left uh, before five. Does anyone else have questions they would like to ask or comments to make that have not had a chance? Okay. <laughs> I do, Mr. Gandhi? Oh, no, I mean, I, I can just chime in if there's no other questions sure. real quick. I think one of our struggles is, um, so the name of the task force was the LRE Behavior Task Force. It's because under special education law, we are required to provide the child with the least restrictive environment. And what that means is outside of the time that's n dictated by their IEP for their special education services that they're receiving, we still have to provide as much as possible uh, their general education services, which is the educational aspect of everything else that we do to provide for all children within our district. So when we contract with great individualized specialized services such as Ann Carlson or other autism center that specialize in that one service that meets the IEP need, we're still lacking the rest of the day component um, based on that student's IEP requirement and what's the LRE restrictions that they have on providing the rest of their center. So if we send a student to Ann Carlson for half a day, then what are we doing for the other half of the day and how are we meeting those students' programming needs? I think that's kind of where that gap in that conversation that we're trying to address. Thank you. Robin. So is it, so is it fair to say that we couldn't do this without our community partners? I believe we're stronger for our community partners. Our partnerships have really made us all more united and more stronger and we better serve students and the families receive the supports that they need as well. So is it also fair to say then that um, we wouldn't, a lot of these models, we probably wouldn't be employing direct employers of everybody that works in these, this type of delivery? It, is it, is it, it we, we know the advantages of contracting third party services right. and the depth of the services, but I think there was a misunderstanding by some previous to this task force that we would employ everybody with these students, and I think that's very important to underscore. I don't, I don't, personally, I don't think we have the capability to do that. No, you're right. right. Okay. Does either superintendent have something to add to Robin's question? I, no, I think she had the right assumption. I think my only thing would be LRE, um, and when we look at special education services, it's not defined by a physical space, it's defined by time. So least restrictive environment means the amount of time in a school day a child receives special education services versus general education services as well. Um, so whatever programs that we develop, I think one of the main critical attributes was that there needs to be a clear exit strategy and fluidity within the program as well. So we want to be able to provide a spectrum of services starting with level A, level B, level C that all of our students can progress out and meet their needs. But it's not about the physical location that will dictate what type of service it is. It's about the time, amount of time the student spends in a general education classroom versus when they're receiving special education services. All right, it's 5 p.m. I would uh, like to thank everyone for their additional time given to this process this evening and wish you all a great evening. Again, thank you very much. I'm sure we will be having many more conversations about this within our own districts and possibly together. Thanks again. Meeting adjourned.